there are many churches which um, will ask you if you have the Holy Spirit. And to some individuals, they view having a particular gift of the Spirit as the evidence of whether or not a person is um, endowed with the Holy Spirit. But through our study tonight, we're going to analyze and see what the Bible has to say about one particular gift, and that is the gift of tongues. And in the process of doing that, I'm sure that we'll have an understanding of the, the extent to which the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit determine whether or not a person has the Holy Spirit. Okay? Good evening, Ashley. All right. So let's um, just jump right into it. Uh, the first question that I have for tonight is, is speaking in tongues a gift of the Holy Spirit? And for the answer to that question, we are going to go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And while I'm doing that, in case I need to post some text, I will pull up my uh, Bible on the computer. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what does this text tell us? Well, first of all, according to the Bible, speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit given to edify the church, just as all the spiritual gifts. Uh, they're all to edify the body of Christ. Um, and we can find that in uh, Ephesians, I believe. But the Bible tells us that speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it is biblical. So that leads us to our next question. How many times does the Bible give an account of individuals speaking in tongues? And the answer to that question is three times. Uh, there's one reference in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. There's another reference in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46. And the third and final reference is in Acts chapter 19 and verse 6. So the Bible has basically three accounts of individuals speaking in tongues. Now when I say accounts, what I'm referring to is actual documented times in which a person um, has been recorded speaking in tongues, when it actually has happened. So these aren't just the only references to speaking about tongues. I believe there's seven references, seven or eight references in all in references about tongues, but um, uh, there are actually only three of those eight references which actually record when individuals have spoken tongues. <clears throat> All right, now let's move on to our third question. In the first account of this spiritual gift, what took place? All right, so we're going to turn to our first scripture reference, and that is in Acts chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Acts chapter 2, if you're following along, verses 6 to 11. And as we go through this study, please feel free to uh, ask any questions that you might have on this topic. Okay, and verse 6 starts out, actually let me switch this, uh, okay, here we go. Okay, let's start out with uh, verse 11. <clears throat> I'm, well, I'm losing it here. Verse 6, I'm sorry. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speaking in his own language. Now keep in mind as I read this that this is taking place um, during Pentecost. Okay, uh, Verse 4 tells us about how the Holy Ghost um, had come and filled up the disciples. Uh, they had all received the Holy Spirit and they began to speak uh, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And verse 5 goes on to tell us that there were men um, dwelling in Jerusalem who were devout Jews <coughs> from every nation under heaven. 
And then verse 6 that I just read tells us that um, when this was noised abroad um, and people were, were brought together, um, they were confounded because every man heard these disciples speaking in his own language. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in his own tongue? Wherewith we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in uh, Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Phrygia uh, and Pamphylia and e in Egypt and in parts of Li Libya, about Cre uh, Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, what's going on here? Based on, this, on the description that's given in Acts, we learn that after receiving this gift, the people, uh, the people present witnessing this event heard the disciples speaking in their own languages. Let me take you back to those, to those verses. Notice in verse 6 it says, they were confounded because that every man heard them, the disciples, speaking in his own language. So the Bible here is telling us that the people surrounding, uh, witnessing the, the disciples speaking in tongues, heard them speaking in them, the people surrounding's own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, aren't these guys Galileans? How is it that we hear every single, uh, sorry, every man uh, in our own tongues? And then they go on to list some of those tongue, uh, some of those languages that they heard the disciples speaking: Parthians and Medes and Elamites, Mesopotamians. Uh, it goes on to talk about the Asians, the um, the Egyptians, uh, the Cyrenes, the Romans, the Jews, uh, and all the and all the uh, the proselytes. So all of these individuals are speaking in languages um, declaring the wonderful works of God. So when these individuals heard the disciples speaking, they recognized the languages that they were speaking in as their own. Okay, So they were amazed, um, <clears throat> shouting out, how is it that we hear these people speaking in our languages? And the specific tongues or languages that the disciples were heard um, were the were the languages of the people who were the disciples weren't heard in Acts chapter two speaking an unknown sort of uh, babel or or unrecognizable language, but they were heard speaking the languages of the people present. Okay, so that is the the first biblical account of tongues. And during Pentecost, the Bible shows that when uh, they had received the gift of tongues. It was recognized by the surrounding people that the disciples were speaking in their native languages um, then present, in which they were born. So that brings us to our next question. Can the average person understand when others speak in tongues? Acts chapter 2 and verse 11 gives us that answer. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speaking in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So when an individual speaks in tongues, the surrounding people who hear the individuals who speak in tongues will be able to understand uh, what they're saying. Okay? And that's according to verse 11. How is it possible that they recognize that the disciples were, were speaking the wonderful works of God unless they understood exactly what it is that they were saying? All right? And verse um, 6 makes it even clearer that every man heard them speaking in his own language. All right. So when the disciples were speaking in tongues, they were heard and understood by those surrounding people uh, to be speaking in the languages of the people present. That's going to lead us to our next question. I'll just get there on my notes. Couldn't that mean that the people in the area were given the ability to understand? So perhaps the disciples, as some would say, were actually speaking in an unknown language, 
but God gave all of those individuals the ability to understand and interpret what they were saying. Is that possible? No. God gave the disciples the gift of tongues, remember? He didn't give the listeners the gift of ears, which means that they would be able to understand and hear. The Bible does not say that God did anything to these individuals. It on, rather, it only states that the disciples were given the ability to speak in tongues. And the surrounding people clearly understood it, which means that the tongues were earthly languages. All right. So the gift of tongues was given to the disciples as a means of communication with people of different nations who they could not communicate uh, with before. Remember, um, something interesting to, to point out here uh, from Acts chapter 2. Uh, let's take a look at verse 7, the latter half of the verse. It says, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Well, you see, that's significant because... The individuals, the disciples who were given the gift of tongues were all Galileans, and that was the language in which they spoke. So how is a group of Galileans supposed to communicate a gospel to the entire world? Is that possible? Well, the things which are not possible with men are very possible with God. And you see, the gift of tongues was given to these Galileans so that the surrounding people at Pentecost were able to understand <coughs> um, the disciples speaking um, in their native tongues. Okay? So God gave them this gift to be able to communicate with those surrounding groups of people. So that means that they could not have been speaking uh, in unknown language because the surrounding people heard and understood that they were speaking in their own native tongues. But rather, the gift of tongues was given as a means of communication to reach those individual groups. Okay, so just to clarify, I'm hope, I hope I'm making myself clear here. Um, the, God did not give the surrounding people the ability to hear and to understand um, the Galileans. Rather, the Galileans were given the ability to communicate using languages that they had not priorly known um, so that the people surrounding uh, from all over the world, the, the devout men, uh, actually the Bible calls them devout Jews from... Uh, from various nations, Egypt, um, um, some Roman, some Greek, uh, some Egyptian. They were given the ability to speak in those languages so that they could communicate the gospel to those surrounding groups of people. Okay? Any questions on that? I'll pause for a moment. Hope I made it clear. Again, if you're just watching... You can click on the click here to enter chat, um, log into the chat room, and feel free to ask any questions. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll uh, I'll move on to the next. Okay, so we discussed that um, the gift of tongues could not have been. Um, something where God gave the listeners the ability to hear and understand um, an unknown language. But rather, the disciples were given a gift to communicate the gospel to um, a surrounding group of people which spoke in all different manner, manners of, uh, of languages. Okay, So it wasn't the gift of ears that was given, it was the gift of tongues. So that brings us to our next question. Um, let's take a look at uh, the second account of individuals speaking in tongues. And that comes to us in Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. Okay, remember, there's only three. And it says... There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God alway. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come, up before, uh, are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men 
to Joppa and called for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which came... Sorry, and when the angel... soldier of them that uh, that waited on him continually and when he had declared all these things unto them he sent them to Joppa all right now we're going to skip ahead a little bit in the story um, Peter has the dream in which uh, God tells him that he is to go with these individuals and not to view anything that God has cleansed as unclean and you'll remember from uh, from Bible history that the Jews and the um, uh, Gentiles did not get along, and the reason for that was that Jews considered themselves um, to be the clean, whereas the Gentiles were considered unclean, and you do not associate with the unclean. But remember that Jesus died to save us, and he reconciles whosoever will come with the Father. All right, so when you go down into the, the baptismal waters of repentance, you come up a Christian and it makes no difference Jew or Greek um, Gentile or or, or, uh, or Hebrew um, we're all one in Christ and so through this vision in Acts chapter 10 God teaches Peter that lesson so we're gonna skip down to um, same chapter Acts chapter 10 And we're going to go to verse 23. Then, uh, then called he them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And he talked with him. He went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the church today could have that same attitude towards other Christians? Rather than being separated by race or sex or... Um, other uh, forms of things that separate us verse 29 therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me and Cornelius said four days ago I was fasting until this hour and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house and behold a man stood before me in bright clothing and said Cornelius thy prayer is heard and thine alms are had, are had in remembrance in the sight of God Send therefore to Joppa, and call, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner, by the, by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou hast come. Sorry, that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. And here it goes. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God. Even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, 
and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge and uh, to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? All right, so um, I thought it was important to read that whole chap uh, part of the chapter of Acts because it's significant and it shows us um, that the Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles who the Jews at first considered unclean because they didn't have any part with the Gentiles. But notice that it says um, that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So, question. If the gift of tongues is an unknown language, how come Peter knew that they were magnifying God? Hmm. But you see, the interpretation doesn't stop just there. Listen to what Peter says in Acts chapter 11 and verse 15. Acts chapter 11 and verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. This is Peter's account of what just happened. The Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Okay? So when was the beginning? When did the Holy Ghost first fall on uh, the disciples? Well, remember, that happened at Pentecost. And what happened at Pentecost? The Galileans began to speak with the languages of the people present. And so here in Acts chapter 11, verse 15... Peter points out that the Holy Ghost fell on uh, Cornelius and his group as it did on the uh, disciples, the Galileans, in the beginning, at Pentecost. And so you see the same exact thing happened to Cornelius as what happened on Pentecost, meaning that the um, Cornelius and his, and, his, and his group were able to speak with languages that others could understand. And they had not priorly known. And what's interesting is that the reason we know, another reason why we know this is because back in Acts chapter 10, it tells us that they heard them magnify God. So here is another clear reference that when individuals speak in tongues, they are speaking in known languages for the purpose of communicating the gospel. Let's go to our third and final reference, Acts chapter 19 and verse 6. Okay, so what we just learned is that if the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and his group just like it did uh, at Pentecost, then individuals could not be speaking in an unknown um, language. They were rather speaking in known languages, just like what happened at Pentecost. All right, so now we're going to take a look at Acts chapter 19 and verse 6. And this is the third and final reference. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Okay. <clears throat> And all the men were about twelve. Now, um, here again, they began to speak in tongues, and they prophesied. Now, Paul was the most educated and widely traveled of the apostles. And he spoke many languages, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 18. When the Holy Spirit came on these, Ephesian, these twelve Ephesian men... Paul recognized that they were prophesying or preaching in new languages. 
Most likely, they spoke in languages common throughout the Roman Empire, since that was that would be the practical for the most practical thing for spreading the gospel. Luke does not say that they received a form of tongues that was different from the first two examples that we gave. All right, so remember the first two examples in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter ten were identical, because Acts eleven tells us, um, according to Peter, that the Holy Ghost fell on the apostles. Um, the, uh, sorry, the, ho the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and his men the same exact way that it fell on the disciples. Okay? So Luke does not say that they received the form of tongues that was different from the first two examples. So we must assume that it was the same type of gift given at Pentecost. So you'll find that the only times the gift of tongues was associated with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is when people from more than one language, uh, sorry, more than one language group were gathered together thus creating communication barriers. And if you're going to spread the gospel, remember what Jesus said. I think we need to take a look at the, uh, the Gospel Commission in order to get a full uh, appreciation for this. Let's take a look at Matthew. Um, let's see. Matthew 28. Jesus says, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, what's significant here is that there's a problem. You see, Jesus... His disciples were Galileans. How do a group of Galileans, which don't have enough time to learn another language or go to school for another language, being that they're facing persecution left and right, how do these individuals communicate the gospel to every nation, um, sorry, to, to all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? How do you do that if you don't speak their languages? You don't. And that's why the gift of tongues was so important, because it was used as a means to spread the gospel. It was very necessary. And uh, without that gift, they'd have had a rough time baptizing and teaching all nations. I mean, to baptize them or to talk to them is one thing. But remember, teaching is a, is a, is a longer process than just preaching. You know, when you preach, you have your sermon, which could last for about 30 to 40 minutes or maybe longer. And then you know, you're moving from place to place to place. But when you're teaching, teaching can sometimes take days, it can take months, it takes as long as it needs to take. It, um, you see, when you, when you preach, it's one person speaking usually. And, you know, of course, in a congregation, you get an occasional amen or praise the Lord here and there. But in a teaching scenario, it's not about one person speaking and other people listening. It's more of a give and take. I speak, you have a question, you ask me the question. I answer the question. I clarify to make sure that you understand the answer.